السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Dear brothers and sisters everywhere Welcome to a new edition of your program Ask Oda Our phone numbers are as usual Air code 0020238555 248 or 249 and the email address for those who'd like to uh, uh, contact us via email is ask at huda.tv uh, uh, brothers and sisters today uh, Sunday marks the second day of the new Hijri calendar uh, the second day of the great month of Muharram which is the first month of uh, the Islamic calendar and the month of Muharram is a sacred month and that is taken also from its name. Muharram means sacred. Its sanctity actually is laid down in the Quran since Allah created the heavens and the earth. In Surah At-Tawbah, that's chapter number uh, 9 in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 36, And that means Verily, the number of months with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 12. Ithna ashara shahran. That is, in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since He created the heavens and the earth, minha arba'atun hurm. Out of the 12 months, four which are sacred. That is the right religion, so run not yourselves therein. Thalika al-deen al-qayyim, fala tazlimu fihinna anfusakum. That is the meaning of the sacredness of these months. These months first is explained by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the sound hadith which is collected by Imam Al-Bukhari. May Allah have mercy on him. Are three consecutive months, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, and the month of Muharram. Then a month by itself which is Rajabu Mudar. So one has to be extra careful about sins during these four sacred months. That is the meaning of minha arba'atun hurm. No doubt that committing sins is a heinous thing and is really serious uh, during all times. But committing sins, whether minor or major, during these four sacred months, days and nights, is the worst. Is worse than committing sins or the same sins any time else. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doubles the word for good and righteous deeds during these sacred times and in sacred places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also warned us a great deal against committing sins, particularly during these times and while we are in sacred places such as the holy places of Mecca and uh, Medina. So one is uh, encouraged to commit extra or to do extra good deeds as much as possible during these uh, uh, four months, particularly the month of Muharram. And uh, among the best deeds is fasting. And as a matter of fact, it has been reported in the Sawan Hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the best fasting after the month of Ramadan is fasting during the month of Allah or Allah's month, the month of Muharram. So voluntary fasting during the month of Muharram is highly encouraged, particularly on the 10th of Muharram. The 10th of Muharram marks a great event. When the Prophet ﷺ entered al Medina, as the hadith is narrated by the great companion Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, he said that the Prophet ﷺ noticed that Bani Israel were fasting on the 10th of Muharram. He inquired about it. They say that is a day in which Allah saved Bani Israel from the Pharaoh and he drowned the Pharaoh. So we are celebrating that day. Musa celebrated that day by thanking Allah and he fasted on the day. So we too fast on the day. At that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, نَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِمُوسَى وَمَنَّعَ We have more, we have more rights to Musa Alaihi Wasallam than them, than the children of Israel. Uh, 
So he commanded his companions to fast on the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura. And it was obligatory in the beginning. And the Prophet Sallallahu said a great virtues and a great reward for those who will fast even afterward it became voluntary. He uh, encouraged us to observe fasting on the day as he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Siyamu Ashura the 10th of Muharram fasting on the 10th of Muharram Ahtasibu ala Allah I hope that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will give the reward of fasting on the day an expiation for the sins of the past year. Kafara, an expiation for the sins. What kind of sins? The minor sins. Because the major sins would not be forgiven automatically, whether due to attending Friday prayer or fasting during Ramadan or performing Umrah after Umrah. These are all great deeds. They would automatically wipe away and re uh, remove the minor sins. But the major sins, where the person uh, who's indulged in them or in any of them require an independent tawbah and a commitment that the person would not redo that sin once again. So imagine if we, inshallah, in a few days, in eight days from today, will be the 10th of Muharram, if we get to fast on that day. Imagine having all the sins of the past year been taken care of. Those who are lucky to perform Hajj, their sins have been forgiven as well. Those who are lucky to fast on the ninth day of the month of Dhul Hijjah, if they were not performing Hajj, they were very lucky because they have the sins of the past year and a year to come were forgiven as well. Allah the Almighty is the most generous, He's the oft forgiving and the most merciful. So he knows our shortcomings and weaknesses. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us every once in a while throughout the entire year, chances after chances, an opportunity to be seized in order to be forgiven. And it marks the, the vast mercy and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then if one does not seize these opportunities, he is indeed a big loser. By just fasting on the 10th of Muharram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the sins of the past year. <coughs> uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, I never saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so keen to fast on any day other than the ninth day of the 10th day of the month of Muharram, which is uh, Ashura. This hadith is collected by Imam al-Bukhari. I'll continue talking about what's mustahab or recommended uh, during the month of Muharram and uh, the etiquette or the sunnah with regards to fasting on the 10th of Muharram uh, after I take a few phone calls, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Abu Jawad from Jordan. Assalamu alaikum. Are you there? Assalamu alaikum. Okay, let's take the next call and please try again Abu Jawad. Salaman from Nigeria. Salam alaikum. Salaman. Okay. Uh, okay. Please try again. Inshallah, we'll be more than happy to take your phone calls. Uh, as far as the fact that some of the companions said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the, nine, the tenth day of the month of Muharram was also venetrated uh, by the children of Israel uh, because of the event of saving them from the Pharaoh and drowning the Pharaoh. So wouldn't that be considered like copying them fasting on the same day? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said because he did not want to do anything similar to Ahlul Kitab or to non-Muslims, even with regards to the ibadat or the various acts of worship. He said, if I live to see the next year, I shall fast or we shall fast on the ninth as well. So he intended to fast a day before the day of Ashura. So this way will be different in our practices than uh, the children of Israel. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it so happened that he died uh, before reaching uh, the day. So it is a sunnah to fast a day before the 10th of Muharram, let's say the 9th. 
If one fails to fast on the ninth, then perhaps the tenth. If one happened to fast the, uh, the ninth, the tenth, and the eleventh, that will be uh, the best. So the least is to fast only on the tenth. Or a higher level to fast a day before along with Ashura or a day after along with Ashura, along with the tenth. And uh, the best of the best is to fast the three days altogether, the ninth, the tenth, and the eleventh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Abu Jawad, once again from Jordan. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Wa shukullah. Thank you for asking. Sheikh, uh, I have three questions. Please. Um, question number one. Now, uh, the masa on the socks, as in one uh, of your episode, you said that uh, one can do masa on the sock within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. This masa on the sock, is permissible under special circumstances or just under normal circumstances? Okay. And my question number two, reciting Quran in a gathering, Quran or a surah, like Surah Yasin, mm. <clears throat> is it permissible? Reciting Quran in a gathering or in, in congregation, like uh, a group of people recite the same surah all so together? People, especially the group of women, they come together and they recite Quran. Okay, here is a question which is, what is the purpose? Is it for the purpose of education or learning, studying, or they think this is a, 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 an act of worship that we should do it every once in a while to recite a particular surah? Normally, it is done uh, for the sake of some, you know, that uh, uh, something asking from God that there is a barakah if you decide this and you get something. Okay. That kind of thing. And the question number three, how do we deal with the condition like, you know, the non-Muslim, they, you know, on our occasion, like Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Fitr, they say Mubarak, Eid Mubarak, these kind of things. Mm. Like when they, you know, they come religious things like Christmas or other, so can we, you know, wish them? Okay. These are the questions. Thank you, Sheikh. You're most welcome. Thank you, Abu Jawad. Uh, wiping over the socks, fabric socks, leather socks, or the shoes has been reported in many sound and uh, with a continuous testimony, a hadith. One of these hadith is narrated by Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him. So for uh, the uh, resident, Al-Muqim, as uh, Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated, يَوْمٌ وَلَيْلَةٌ A day and night, 24 hours. And for the musafir, ثلاثة أيام بلا يليها three days and three nights uh, 72 hours from the time that you make wudu from the time you start making wudu while wiping over your socks you count 72 hours if you're traveling or 24 hours if you are a resident under normal conditions it does not have to be due to a necessity such as in cold weather or if uh, you are on the road, or if you're all dressed up and you cannot take off your socks. No. During normal conditions, you may keep the socks on and you wipe over the socks and the tahara or the wudu is valid. Wallahu ta'ala a'la a'la. Reciting Surah Yaseen in congregation for a particular purpose because it brings goodness and it uh, uh, repels evil. Uh, this has not been reported by the Prophet ﷺ, nor is it the right practice. Every person may read of the Quran as much as you want at any occasion. But to sit a certain occasion in a certain fashion of reading the Quran, like in the, the schools of the Quran, normally we see the students, whether youngsters or uh, adults, are reading all together, repeating after the Shaykh for the purpose of learning. That's 100% valid. But the practice which I wanted to investigate by asking a second question, where people get together and recite a particular surah to fulfill a particular need or to pray for somebody who is sick or somebody who is dead or passed away, that is not prescribed by the Prophet Sallallahu and it elevates to the level of innovation, which means it will be uh, rejected. The proper way of reciting the Quran is either you recite yourself for your own self and ponder its meaning, or recite for others in an out loud and a melodious voice, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ tartila, Or at least to be one of the audience to listen to the recitation of the Qur'an by 
another good reciter. Wallahu a'la wa a'lam. Assalamu alaikum. Noura from Sudan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, remember I asked regarding my parents uh, last week where I just found out after the phone call that uh, my father is uh, sick with the fifth stage of lung cancer and um, so he is in sort of his final stages. Um, we did ask him, you know, to try and uh, read the Quran and things like that, but he's not re read the Quran for a very long time. So mm. he did ask whether it's okay to read it in English, as in the translation. Um, how do I advise him and, and what best can I say to him so that, you know, he will make the most out of the few uh, days or Is he a Muslim? Left. Yes, of course, yes. Okay, does he uh, pray? Uh, unfortunately, not that I know of. And so he, he doesn't pray and you want him to read the Quran before it's too late. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. He wants to know whether he can read it in English. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Wa jazakum. Thank you, Noah. Uh, I feel sorry for your father. First of all, may Allah give him shifa and hidayah. May Allah guide him and cure him. If somebody dies in this condition where he does not pray, does not put his forehead before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and prostrate himself in sujood, then he's in trouble. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-ahdu alladhi baynana wa baynahum as-salaa faman tarakaha faqad kafar. He is indeed in a serious trouble. And that's why I should focus most right now on the fact that he has to pray. If he is so sick that he cannot stand up in prayer, he may pray while sitting down or in any position as long as facing the Qibla and making tahara. And if he starts praying right now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him, hopefully, his previous sins. If he repented right now, it will be enough and it will be an expiation for the previous sins. But he has to be sincere in his repentance. But how good is it to read the Quran, whether in English or Arabic, when the person is not even willing to pray? And uh, he is, unfortunately, Muslim. It's a very sad situation. So uh, you need to work hard before it's too late uh, to advise him to start praying. If you have family members who are around him, say, if you love, if you love him, you need to help him out to pray on a regular basis, whatever prayers are left uh, for him in this life. Then along with the prayer, read the Quran in Arabic. He said he, he cannot uh, read it in Arabic, read the meaning in English in addition to listening to the Quran. And I believe now it is available. You can listen to the Quranic verses in Arabic followed by the meaning in, in English. So that will be the best format because reading the English meaning by itself isn't sufficient. It won't give you the inspiration of the word of Allah. You, you're listening to the word of Allah. So what I recommend for you and for every person who does not know Arabic, download or buy the Quran uh, recitation. It's available online for free along with the interpretation by a nice voice so that you can listen, enjoy listening to the Qur'an. Meanwhile, understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means in these verses. Do not forget to call your family members and highly recommend for them that your dad must repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and start praying before it's too late. Assalamu alaikum. Fawziya from Nigeria. Uh, wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Sister Fawziya. Go ahead, please. I hear you. Um, I have one question. Please go ahead. Um, the question is what is the ruling on using cosmetics such as perfumes and the likes that contains alcohol? Okay. Does it? Okay. Oh, alcohol based cosmetics. If the alcohol percentage is very insignificant, then it is permissible. Uh, and this is in most cases, of course. The dispute between the scholars with regards to perfumes particularly, because it's in the liquid form, uh, which contains alcohol, is due to the fact that some of the scholars believe that alcohol is impure, 
we all agree that alcohol is haram as far as consumption but with regards to whether it is najis or not there is a difference of opinions some of the scholars say not because it is haram it has to be najis because gambling is haram but the, the, the gambling tools or the money that's used in gambling is not haram the gambling machines is not najis I mean is not impure I mean with the impurity that if you touch it then you'll have to wash it off exactly like urine for instance or like any other impurities you have to wash it off so they consider a group of the scholars consider alcohol impure and accordingly they say if you wear alcohol based perfume you're wearing nudges and you cannot pray with this impurity but as I said if the alcohol is in insignificant percentage then it is okay uh, other uh, cosmetic uh, means such as lipstick eyeliners eyelashes and uh, all of the and creams as long as it does not also contain any uh, pig products because that too is impure so if it is uh, free of any uh, impurities then of course it is halal uh, to use it Wallahu ta'ala a'la a'lam we had uh, Suleyman's third question about non-Muslims greeting us with our Eid and saying Eid Mubarak or happy and blessed Eid I would say thank you so much appreciate it and of course you have to respond in a nice way إِذَا حِيُّتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا if a non-Muslim even greets me I should greet him likewise or give a better greeting but uh, as far as beginning non-Muslims were uh, with uh, uh, congratulations or greetings in their holidays it depends religious holidays when I say happy Christmas Christmas Eve or whatever one have to understand the concept of celebrating Christmas the concept of celebrating whatever religious occasion if it is something pertaining the aqidah and belief somebody is celebrating the birth of God what's so good about that well, it's not it's not even uh, logical so I would not uh, uh, I won't be allowed to uh, play a part or to congratulate somebody for celebrating the birth of uh, of what he believes that is a God Jesus was one of the prophet uh, the Allah's messengers like Muhammad sallallahu and Ibrahim and, and Musa and we all revere him but we don't believe that he was more than than uh, a prophet so uh, congratulating on Muslims for the celebrations which are uh, based on false belief is not permissible in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Asya from the KSA Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I have three questions Please <coughs> Is it permissible to wish happy Islamic New Year? Can Muslim country give holiday on the remembrance of this day? Question number two Can uh, we wish Jummah Mubarak? Question number three What is the difference between information and knowledge of being nowadays many people claim we have lot of knowledge and information but we can't but, but we don't see them practice him can you please comment on that and uh, my one more request of explaining that uh, uh, about that imam ghazali uh, i just wanted to remind that uh, i hope you remember jazakallah khair Wajazakum, Sister Asya, thank you so much. Very uh, good questions. MashaAllah, you need a whole program to answer just uh, three of your questions. Suleiman from Nigeria, welcome back to the program, Suleiman. Suleiman from Nigeria, welcome back to the program, Suleiman. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Would you please uh, mute your TV, uh, Suleiman? My, my question is your. I wanted the last time you were talking on the. Islamic position on, on, on pictures, on photographs. And incidentally, I, I, was, I couldn't hear it at all because we had to go for prayers. Okay. 
Okay, quickly, Suleiman, once again, uh, I was talking about hanging pictures and photos against the wall. That is not permissible. Or displaying them in the room because as the Prophet said, it bans angels from entering this room or this house. And as the Prophet once was praying and there was a curtain facing him, it has a picture of an image of a bird. And after the Prophet finished, he ordered Aisha to bring it down and tear it apart. And he stuffed it as a liner for a cushion. So he was talking about those kind of pictures or images, not just the statues. As far as to, uh, taking pictures uh, on the, the, the digital cameras, on your desktop, on your uh, iPad, on your uh, phone, uh, and I see many of the scholars allowed that as long as those pictures uh, do not, for instance, take pictures of uh, any of your women, where it can be unsafe for somebody to see them or to look at them. So one has to be careful with that, with taking pictures even with those uh, digital cameras and save them in a proper place because losing them or accidentally transmitting them via email or, or a message to somebody else is, is very risky. So one has to be careful. Taking pictures of your family members, your uh, kids as they're grown up or playing, uh, or their graduation or with the digital cameras, as long as you keep them on your desktop, uh, I believe, inshallah, there is nothing wrong with that. What's, what's problematic is printing them and hanging them against uh, the wall or displaying them in the room. Because this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa forbidden. Allah ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. May Allah guide us to what's best. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad from the KSA. How are you, Shaykh? Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Wa alaikum assalam, Shaykh. How are you? I'm great, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Shaykh, still waiting for you in Medina. Keep waiting for me, inshallah. I'll visit it one more time. As long as you're waiting and making dua for me to come, inshallah, I'll make it one day. I know it's your wish to come to Medina. May Allah fulfill your wish to come Ameen. and stay here forever. Ameen. I, uh, I uh, believe, I have, I have a comment on that after you finish, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead, okay. Ya Muhammad. Shaykh, uh, I have two questions. Mm. I, I, I am a doctor, uh, so what happened, uh, I treated a small child, he had a pulled elbow, and I treated him, and the father was happy, and he gave me a hadiya, money. Uh, so, we, me and my other colleague had a discussion regarding this, whether it is allowed to accept this hadiya, or it is haram or halal. Whether when someone is happy from your work and if he gives you some money or whatever, uh, is this allowed or no? And my second question is, what is the ruling? Do on, you have uh, your private practice or do you work for the government? No, no, no. no, I, no, no, no I am working for the uh, private hospital here. For? I am working under a sponsorship for a private hospital. So it's a private hospital? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's exactly opposite to the mosque, mosque Quba. You can visit me, inshallah. Mm, mashallah. So, uh, is it allowed? And my second question is, uh, what is the ruling on uh, people kiss, uh, greeting each other uh, by kissing cheek to cheek? We, it's a very common practice here. Mm. But this is allowed or it is not allowed. Okay. Thank you, Muhammad, from... Uh, Okay, it's a Um Aisha, Nigeria. Salam alaikum. Okay, let's take a short break, and inshallah, after that, we'll get back with you to answer these pending questions. Say stay tuned. The show is to really focus and gain a grasp of those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and those things which will gain for us the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and will make us amongst those who are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there any evidence from the Quran that shows that those who repent are beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happier, is more happier with the repentance 
of his slave than you if he came across your camel after you lost it in a wide open. The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enable us to uh, reach into a status wherewith or in which we will taste the beauty of Iman. We would like to be amongst those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Indeed, you will see your Lord as you see this moon without having any harm in seeing the moon. Welcome all of you to another exciting and new episode of your program, Let's Talk. If we listen to someone talking about Islam, we should really know their credentials and if they really are the experts they say they are. This man is an expert in Islamic Sharia. <laughs> it's crazy. They use the knowledge for the sake of Allah. Media with its emphasis, with its agenda, with the spin. Okay, you guys, today we're going to talk about a very important topic that has been neglected by Muslims around the world. And they would say, whatever happening in Somalia is a Somali problem, whatever's happening in Pakistan is a Pakistani problem. Islam doesn't forbid people to, to adhere to technology. You guys at home, you hear the doctor. He's telling you guys to be environmentally friendly, go pick up trash, plant a tree, do something good for the environment. It is our responsibility as Muslims. The Sheikh told us about two Egyptians who decided to move on the spot right. to look at the problem. I like the the extreme sports yeah right and i tried to search what is this yeah i okay. know this is a cold punch they hugged each other and they said abu Bakr is my my best friend Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. We have, mashallah, a bunch of questions. The first is from uh, Sister Asya from the KSA. Uh, uh, wishing people a happy Hijri calendar or happy uh, Hijri year, the beginning of the Hijra year. Uh, first of all, we all have to understand that the beginning of the Islamic calendar uh, actually was decided at the era of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, when he consulted the companions uh, and many of at tabarin with regards to the best time that they should take as the beginning of the Islamic calendar. And they've all agreed after uh, many proposals that the Hijrah was the greatest event. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثَانِيَ ثَنَيْنِ Because Allah considered the Hijrah the actual beginning of the Muslim state. And He considered it a victory. Victory without any bloodshed, without fighting. So um, that was decided at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab رضي الله عنه. Secondly, the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ did not take place in the month of Muharram. As a matter of fact, it started in Safar and it ended in the Shahr Rabi' al-Awwal. So it is just a, a date. So that's why it's an unprecedented, something that did not happen at the time of the Prophet or the companions that they wished each other a happy Hijri year because it was not a Eid. It was not a Eid. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when he observed people celebrating different days, they said, no, 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 we only have two holidays, two Eids, two festivals, Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fatr. And each one of them follows a great act of worship. Eid al-Adha follows the Hajj, and Eid al-Fitr crowns the fasting during the month of Ramadan. So if somebody tells me, happy Hijri year, I would say, same to you, and thank you so much, I would not uh, uh, turn him down. But it is not something that is stated in the Sunnah to wish each other uh, a happy uh, Hijri Eid, like uh, the two Eids. Uh, wishing each other a happy and a blessed Friday, when it happens occasionally, as if it is not something that is prescribed, that is okay as well. So it is not something that every Friday we have to tell people happy uh, Jumu'ah or may an accepted Jumu'ah or any of that. It is a holiday, but the greeting itself 
When it happens as a dua, fine, but it is not something that we have to greet each other with. Similar to some cultural traditions uh, following the prayers. Some people believe that if you finish the prayer, you must shake hands with the person to your right and the person to your left and wish them uh, an accepted prayer. <laughs> not only that, wish them that inshallah they're going to pray in the haram by saying haraman. Uh, what's really interesting is that the person has to answer you saying jaman, hopefully all of us together. When it happens occasionally, when you're praying for somebody, that's fine. But when some people believe it is an essential part of the prayer and the prayer is invalid without it, then it becomes problematic. This is definitely an innovation. And the best proof to that is when you see people who are coming for the, from those cultures and performing Hajj or Umrah, they're praying where? In the Haram. Normally the dua that they, uh, they make and the, the greeting that they exchange after the prayer in their cultures is Haraman, which is, I hope that we get to pray in the Haram. So you're already in the Haram. What is the purpose of saying Haraman again while you are already in the Haram? Indicating that it's something that's not from the Sunnah. But when somebody says, uh, have you an accepted Jum'ah? I will say the same to you. And no problem. Happy and accepted and happy uh, uh, new Hijr year, I say, same to you. Uh, the difference between information and knowledge, and obviously you mentioned the, the, the knowledge that the people accumulate or pile up in, in Islamic uh, knowledge uh, versus practice, that they don't put this into practice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sorted this out in the Quran when he said in an ayah, and this ayah even though it, it, it labels Bani Israel because it talks about the Torah, but it is much more general and it has a broader meaning than to limit it only to Bani Israel. It is criticizing a behavior rather than just certain people. He said, مثل الذين حملوا التوراة ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحمل أسفارا The parable of those who have been given the Torah but they did not act upon it, exactly like a donkey. Its back is loaded with asfar, with books. The donkey does not read. The donkey does not understand what he is carrying on its back. So this is the similarity between somebody who studies and learns and have knowledge, but he does not put this knowledge into practice. So that's why I said it is uh, much general to limit it to certain people. Whenever a Muslim is studying and studying and studying, but he is completely disconnected in his practice from the study and the knowledge that he accumulated and piled up, then he uh, is undergoing the same example that Allah mentioned in the Quran and displays this practice. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَسْفَارَ Assalamu alaikum. Nawal from the KSA. Walaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum Nawal. Walaikum assalam. Alaikum assalam. I hear you. How are you? How are you, Uncle? I'm great, Alhamdulillah, and I'm very happy to hear your voice. Assalamu alaikum. Nawal, can you hear me? <clears throat> okay. Try again, Nawal, please. I'd like to hear from you. Uh, with regards to Al Imam Al Ghazali, he was born in the 5th Hijri uh, century. He was exactly born the year 450 after the migration of the Prophet. So that was after the three best generations that the Prophet predicted. And afterward, the fitan have started and so on. Uh, his name is Muhammad ibn Ahmad al tusi because he was born in Tus. So what about Al-Ghazali? Al-Ghazali is not actually a name. Al-Ghazali was the nickname of his father. He earned that name due to the fact that he was working in the ghazl, waving and textiling. He used to make carpets and stuff like that from Al-Ghazl. And uh, so accordingly, he was given this name, like al saqa for a water bearer who gives people uh, uh, water, uh, uh, the shoemaker would be given uh, a title due to his job. 
and so on. So he was given this name due to this fact, but his name is Muhammad ibn Ahmad Tusi. What really concerns us most after knowing his name, where he was born, what year he was born in, uh, his education and his background. He was a great philosopher as far as philosophy. And he studied different uh, types of philosophy, even non-Islamic philosophy, and that affected his uh, Islamic studies as well, and it reflected on his writings. He was a great imam and a great writer, but he had tasawwuf in most of his writings. Tasawwuf to some of the extents that, that in order to read his books, you have to be aware of the proper aqidah, be able to pick and choose. So he was a great author, was a, a great writer, and one of his books, very famous, is Ihya wa Ulum al Deen. And it is a marvelous book, but we do not advise uh, the beginners of seekers of knowledge to read this book because the book is full of weak and fabricated hadith and some uh, misunderstandings or improper understanding of the aqidah issues. And that's why I would refer you to the books of Ibn al Qayyim, uh, for, in, for instance, in a state. Uh, it is also known that Al Imam al Ghazali, may Allah have mercy on him, towards the end of his life, uh, he repented from this uh, extreme tasawwuf and he has uh, great writings as well. But I would say for beginners, rather read the books of Ibn al Qayyim uh, in a state. Afterward, when you are uh, excelled in different uh, fields of uh, religious knowledge and you know what's sound, what's profound, and what's weak, and you can find out the weak points, perhaps you can read those books uh, as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahmed from Ghana. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah bless your work and uh, bless us too. Amin, and you too. Thank you so much. Sheikh, I have uh, one question for the start, and uh, it involves a uh, shutting of uh, prayer. Is it compulsory that as uh, I'm traveling on a distance, let's say that will go beyond 40 miles, and in my own car, do I still have to? Well, once I'm traveling in my own car, I definitely have to uh, uh, wash it fully. Then the other thing too has to do with uh, if I'm traveling on the plane, well, am I supposed to wash it in the plane, or I should just uh, keep on until I touch the, the ground? Okay. Allah Thank you, Ahmed. Jazakallah khairan. Shortening the prayer. Uh, Al-Jumhur, which refers to the vast majority of the Muslim Jews, are of the view that if you travel the travel distance of 83 kilometers, uh, then once you leave your hometown, once you're out of town, you are permitted and have the concession of shortening the prayer. It is not a wajib. The difference between the scholars whether it is preferable or not. Then it is indeed preferable to shorten the prayer because the Prophet ﷺ did so as he was traveling in all of his journeys. There is an opinion which says that any travel which is considered safar or traveling, even if it is shorter than this distance, even if it is just three miles, as long as you call it travel, leave in town and uh, leave in the buildings of your hometown and go into another town, that would allow you to uh, shorten the prayer because the Prophet ﷺ did not specify a certain distance. Number of days likewise, the Jumhur are of the view that if you plan to stay more than four days, then from day one you pray on full along with the, with the Sunan, the Nawafil before and after. But if your stay is not determined, as long as you're staying, you get to shorten the prayer, and this is better and preferable. And you're exempt from praying any sunan or nawafil, except the two rak'ahs before fajr, and praying the witch, because the Prophet ﷺ used to observe them on a regular basis. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Um, Dr. Muhammad from the KSA, he said that he treated a child and his dad was happy with the treatment so he gave him uh, a gift. Uh, case number one, if this is your private practice, you, uh, this is your business. 
you take it, you leave it, it's entirely up to you. You take it and you give it to me, that would be best, of course. Uh, but it is not prohibited. But now if you're working for a firm or a government, then we are guided by guidelines and rules. Why? Because of the least doubt that I may give the person a special treatment because next time when he comes to me, that he give me a gift. So I would give him preference, spend more time with him. Or, or, that's why if the owner of the business is okay with that and is aware that somebody gives you a gift or people give you gifts and he does not mind, then no problem. But personally, I would believe, I would, I would stay and I would say thank you so much because I'm just doing my business. Why? Because of this shubha, the doubt. We have the incident which is not related exactly because the other one was a public uh, job uh, in which the Prophet Sallallahu sent one of his companions to collect uh, zakah fund. So the people gave him uh, some money or wealth. When he came to deliver the amana, he collected the zakah and he gave it to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, this is yours and this is mine. So the Prophet Sallallahu uh, climbed the member, he gathered the ummah and he said, why don't any of you sit down or stay back in the house of his parents and see who's going to give him a gift. He was giving a hint to this guy that if you have not been appointed by the state, by the government, if we did not send you, or these guys recognize you, or these guys come to your house and say, take this gift because we love you. No, they only gave you gift for a special interest. It is not identical to your case, but what I'm saying is if the owner or the owner of the hospitals uh, or the project that you're working for are okay with that and they are aware of that and you're not giving him a special treatment next time because he gave you a gift, then it is permissible to take it. The best of the best is just to do your job and whenever somebody gives you a gift, say, brother, I was just doing uh, my job because this is not your uh, personal practice. Brothers and sisters, by that we come to the end of today's episode of Ask Uda. By the end, I can but ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pardon me and forgive me for any shortcoming and I'm full of shortcomings and errors. May Allah guide all of us and teach us what's best. May Allah teach us what we don't know and help us to act upon what we have learned. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. And until next time, I leave you in the care of Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech, your mercy is what I beseech.